So what makes the culture? I think it is people that don't take themselves super seriously. So I think there's a humility. I think that's an important part of the culture. I think we're doing great things. I think we are winning the market, but we don't feel like we need to boast about it as much as some people might. I think there's a desire to win. I think there's a competitive streak that exists throughout the organization in a healthy way, but really win the right way. Hey there, dental economist. If you're a dentist owner or a leader within a dental business thinking about growing production, case acceptance, patient and staff satisfaction, positive outcomes, and everything else that comes with running a dental business, then you're a dental economist and you've come to the right place. Welcome to The Dental Economist Show. We're meeting at the intersection of profit and purpose as I sit down with dental leaders who share their stories about dentistry, business, and growth. Welcome back to The Dental Economist Show with me, Mike Huffaker. Today, we're thrilled to have Eric Gieske join us. Eric is the visionary CEO of Planet DDS, a leader in cloud-based dental software solutions. Under his leadership, Planet DDS has become synonymous with innovation and efficiency, providing cutting-edge tools that streamline operations and enhance patient care for thousands of dental practices across the country. His strategic foresight and dedication to technology adoption have positioned Planet DDS at the vanguard of the dental software industry, transforming how dental professionals leverage technology to grow their practices and improve patient outcomes. Eric's insights into the future of dental technology are shaping the next generation of dental practice management. Welcome to the show, Eric. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Super thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to have you here. For those that don't know, Eric is also my boss. He's not being paid to do this and he, he volunteered and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I actually would like to learn a few things about you that I don't know after working with you for five years. So you've had a really fascinating career journey, a really fascinating career arc, transitioning from running a bottleless water cooler firm to leading this excellent company, Planet DDS. Tell me a little bit more about what a bottleless water cooler firm is, what you did, and what the story of that business is. I, I don't think I've actually ever heard it. Yeah, so it's about as far from a dental software company as you possibly could go. Think about the five gallon bottles of water that you have in the office. When those things have been replaced by these little filter coolers of which we have one outside, they're traditionally installed, piped into, usually under the sink. Filters are changed once or twice a year, but the whole idea is it's eliminating the need for a five gallon jug. The company was in Indianapolis. I moved there in 2013. It was a very heavily distribution heavy kind of labor business. So imagine like field service vans, people going to offices, checking the filters, servicing different type of coolers. It was different. So obviously dental software is a very kind of white collar business, with lots of highly educated technologists and smart, great people like we have. Bono's water cooler companies are a little bit more blue collar. It's a little bit more of a model where you're hiring different types of folks. It was a significant transition. I often tell the story of one afternoon when people are like, what's it like to run a Bono's water cooler company versus a software company? One Friday afternoon, we had just installed tracking devices on all of our vans. And we had told all of our field reps that we had done this. And, and the idea was to reduce insurance costs so we could track them. One of them clearly forgot. And one afternoon, just parked it at the strip mall. And we all kind of knew the strip mall, but we were wondering, it was like two o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, what was going on and why it wasn't moving. Clearly, he had quit for the day, but was still out in the van. And so it turns out he was in a gentleman's club. So we all ended up showing up. About seven of us were made in the office to surprise him in the gentleman's club. We've not had too many situations like that where Planet DDS, Planet Tears have been surprised in gentlemen's clubs by us, but it's a very different type of business when you think about what we do. So you said this is 2013. You bought Planet DDS in 2015 as part of the search fund. 2013 was when you acquired the bottleless water company. Was that also via a search fund? And what was the outcome of that? Like, how did you transition out of that business before acquiring Planet DDS? Yeah, so we actually acquired, I think, in 2010. So search fund as well. And for those unfamiliar with search funds, it's a kind of a single private equity vehicle that you raise capital from lots of high net worth individuals and some small institutional funds to go buy a business you want to, you want to run. And so we had done a ton of acquisitions. So this was very much a platform type situation where you buy one specific. And the biggest dealer we bought was in Indianapolis, but we bought 22 other different dealers around the country. And the idea was you wanted to acquire and create root density and be able to standardize operations across kind of a, a unified brand. It went well. We put a ton of capital in the business. I learned a ton. We ended up selling the business 
in 2015, I left in 2013 to go do this search fund with a good friend of mine. But in 2015, we sold it. Wasn't a great outcome, but it ended up being a great learning experience. And ended up selling it to a strategic services and provides our bottles water cooler company in the office, which is kind of a cool turn of events. But yeah, I learned a ton, continued to stay involved. When I decided to leave that, a good bu- buddy of mine named Blake, Blake Rice, was just graduated from business school and was thinking about doing a search fund. And I remember we were in a hot tub at Okemo, New York on a ski vacation with my family. When we both decided that we both kind of wanted to do this and that I had done it by myself before and I like to do it with a friend. So we, we kind of created a list of what we were looking for in the experience. We talked about specifically kind of what our skills and strengths were. We talked about what it would be like if we didn't, this didn't work out and would we still be friends? And it was kind of the beginning of designing District My Partner. So that was a search fund that we raised in 2000 and I guess around 13, maybe 14. We acquired Planet DDS in 2015 and nine years later, yeah, still doing it. Still wearing Giants hats, still wearing black shirts, looking good. It's probably the best I've ever seen you, actually. It's a, it's a good look. <laughs> it should keep it up. You know me, I'm consistent with my outfits, Mike. This might be what I wear for the next two years. It'll be a, a rebranding. It's fine. I'll ditch the hat. You can own that now moving forward. So you acquired Planet DDS in 2015. You end up owning this relatively small dental software company based in Southern California that had been founded a decade before, really. You know, there had been some kind of key wins already at that point. There were obviously a number of customers that were successful with the product. The team itself, I think you said, I've heard you say in the 20s? Yeah, 25, 30, probably totally, yep. So you and Blake, you show up, you now own this business. You've never been in dental before. You came from tracking trucks down to gentlemen clubs in the afternoon. And you're like, now we're going to be software guys. What was the biggest, maybe, learning curve for you? Was it the dental space? Was it the SaaS space? Was it tech? Was it because you had so many different areas that you needed to learn all of it? What was the biggest challenge? I think technology was the biggest. So I remember when we were were first introduced to the business and somebody had brought up the term tech stack. I remember Blake kind of disappeared and started Googling tech stack because neither of us knew what that was. So I think dental is surprisingly complex as, you know, lots of vernacular, lots of things, insurance is, it's all kind of animal and there are lots of different, obviously, clinical and medical or dental tech procedures that you need to be familiar with. But I think for us, it was definitely the tech piece. When you join, a, I think, a, a software company and you're kind of not a software person and everyone else is, you know, it's hard. It's hard for, you don't speak the language. It's hard for you to, to kind of, it's scary in some ways because so there's so much institutional knowledge, not only from the customer product, but technology side that you don't have. You have to enter that situation with a tremendous amount of humility. You have to listen, you have to learn, you have to be curious, you have to trust. And so you have to build relationships to build that trust. So I would say both, but for me, the technology, because I mean, we are obviously machine critical software, as you know, better than anyone else. So dental groups and dental offices rely on us to do so much in their practice that, you know, if the software isn't performing, you know, that's a big problem. And so you're so beholden to people that not understand the word tech stack that you can't really make an impact or fix things because you really don't understand anything for a while. So the technology was probably harder. Dental took longer to probably learn fully. And I wouldn't say I still probably completely understand all aspects of it, but the technology was the steepest learning curve. It's the thing we had to get smart about quickest. So about the same time Blake was running into an office and, and Googling tech stack, I was at my house Googling SaaS. Roughly the same time period that I decided to get into technology as well. And I can totally appreciate everything you're saying. It is a different world. You mentioned that when you and Blake decided to buy the business, you kind of had that conversation. Are we still going to like each other if it doesn't work out? Obviously it worked out. However, in the period of time, 2015 to 2019, while you guys were building the business before the level equity acquisition, was there any time when you were thinking like, maybe I'm not going to like this guy after this is all said and done? Do you have any like real tense, like kind of panic moments where you thought that it just wasn't going to work out? No, you know, looking back, I think even the roles that we played, of which I think were critical to define, I think were super important and sometimes a cause of tension between us. Because I think you have two type A individuals, good friends who are who really want to do this to drive impact, obviously be involved. And sometimes, although we agreed on most things, there were very few times we didn't. I think there was getting into a groove a little bit about who was doing what. And he was mostly doing a lot of the outside stuff. So he was massively, you know, successful with bringing on new DSOs we'd never brought on. And I was doing more of the operational piece, which helps. But yeah, there were times when we would probably question kind of what each, like some of the decisions other we were making in ways that 
made it for some uncomfortable lunches. But over time, we, I mean, we really learned, I think, how to work together in ways and trust each other and built that relationship with the investors and the board in a way that was helpful. And, and I mean, our friendship changed, of course. I think it does when you work with somebody for four years in any ways, but we're still super close friends. I saw him just a couple of, maybe a month ago. He's doing great. But there were never any situations where our friendship, I say, was kind of at risk. There were definitely some disagreements. And, and when you have two personalities and two strong like leaders and strong leadership qualities, it's sometimes hard for that to work in and you have to work through some things, but no, there was no, no blows were thrown, no, no escalated kind of voices or screaming, no, nothing like that. So it's become, I think, pretty clear now that Planet DDS is winning a lot of the DSO market, the multi-location group market. There's been some really fantastic traction in that space. We've got some really incredible customers that we have the honor and privilege of serving. At what point in those first few years, did you recognize that it was going to be really important to sell to these multi-location groups? And you had told me a story about potentially not being able to sell to larger groups based off of an agreement that had taken place before with a licensing agreement. That to me sounded like it might've been a scary moment post you buying the business. Can you kind of talk a, a little bit about both those things? So our largest customer was Northeast Dental Management, which had 65 locations. Craig Bronowitz, who is a, a friend and someone that I've always kind of looked up to and has taught us a ton about the business. And here were Blake and I who knew nothing about dental and really nothing about software, kind of taking a leap of faith that the software application and the company we were buying, great people and a great platform was really going to work in a multi-location setting. Because our entire investment thesis was very much around the industry is shifting to the cloud, it's consolidating, and we are positioned as the product best suited to solve both of those or take advantage of both those trends. And so I remember we called Craig during the diligence process and the founder, Rich, was great about opening kind of all the customers up for us to talk to them. It's super trusting. We met all the employees in events, some of whom are, I'm glad to say, are still here. And I remember Craig saying, you have to buy this company because basically we never would scale from five locations to 65 without the software, the people, the processes that the software had kind of implemented. And so when we heard that, we knew that the product would work. We knew the team was dedicated. Every company goes through different kinds of series of professionalization and maturation. We definitely needed some of that stuff and it was clear, but like the two most important things, product market fit, good dedicated team, good culture, all that stuff was apparent. So at that point, we knew the product was great. About six months later, Northeast Dental Management was bought by DCA and Dental Care Alliance was you know, at that time, probably 300 locations or maybe 250 locations buying as our largest customer, which was probably about 15% of our revenue. And so we, of course, were like, oh, no, they're going to convert to what they're using because they're obviously much bigger and one of the largest DSOs. And so we were able at that point to go through a very dedicated sales process. Blake led it, did a brilliant job, used Che, a lot of other people internally to kind of walk through that process. And they selected us, which was awesome. So we were able to clearly our, our largest customer today on the Denicon side. But it also taught us that we have the ability not only to, you know, hear from Craig, which we're very appreciative of his insight about going from five to 65, but that a large organization evaluated us and shows us our product and our company to serve them. That was probably the pivotal moment that I knew that most importantly, the product is good enough, obviously can be improved, but good enough and the only one at that time probably that could serve a large DSO. And so that's kind of what, but I mean, that was a no crap moment. We were like, oh man, we spot this business. We could tell our investors that, you know, 10 to 15% of our revenue is going away. But thankfully we were able to kind of work through. Yeah. So you look back at those times and shortly after you acquired the business 2015, I would imagine a few hundred offices using the software at that point, you know, fast forward 10 years, 12,000 practices across the country using some products from Planet DDS. 350-ish employees now from the, the 25, 30 that were there a decade ago. Did at any point when you were embarking upon your search fund search or when you had found Planet DDS, did you think that it had the potential to become what it is today? I think it had the potential to be something special because it was a good product in a market that was accelerating towards needing a product that looked like it. So I, I didn't know that we or the company would end up so quickly growing to where we are today, but... I knew that we had the opportunity because we had such a head start at that point product-wise because we were really, I think it was super prescient by Che and Rich and other folks to design a product for where the industry was going. Maybe a little bit earlier than probably the industry, but the industry caught up and we were lucky enough to have the product when the industry started really moving in that direction. So 
I mean, I never thought, you know, I never thought I would be the CEO of a company of 350 people. If you ask me that, you know, we're 25 people, I'd probably say, right, you know, I have to shave and dress better and do some other things and maybe be a little bit more presentable. But it definitely, you know, it's been fun. It's been, it's really just been so much fun these past nine years. And, you know, last night we did something called the Connie's, which is the first time we've done like an award ceremony, kind of similar to the Dundies within the product and engineering team. And they were, you know, gracious enough to invite me. And it was really cool to see some of the people and, and listen to some of the newer people who had come through acquisition or joined the company more recently, you know, with a couple of drinks, standing up there and say, this is a special culture and everybody's really supportive and everybody cares. That's a hard thing to maintain. I think when you go from 25 to 360, and I think that's the coolest thing of what we've done. And that's the thing I hope we never lose. We'll continue to scale, we'll grow. I think we'll continue to be successful. Obviously, you and I both believe that when you lose that connectivity or that engagement or that sense of like true culture, I think you end up losing some of the, what made you great. That was really cool to see. Even a lot of people I didn't really know or gotten to know to see them go up on stage, accept their award for lots of different like joking things. I got best dressed as I should. But to see people actually say, thank people and say, look, I, it's great. Like, I've only been here six months, but this is a really cool culture and a really cool thing that we're building. Let's talk about that a little bit more because I think it's been super important to you as long as I've known you. And while over the last five years that I've been around, I know that there's been even more focus probably in defining what the culture is. There was always a unique kind of special culture. I think you had the ability to articulate what it was better than most. You always place that emphasis on fun. It's got to be something that, that we enjoy doing. And I remember some of our initial one-on-ones, you're like, are you having fun? I'm like, oh, that's a question that's not often asked at the workplace, but cool. Yeah. Yes, I am. So when you think about the culture of Planet DDS, what makes it unique? Maybe you can go into a little bit more detail and also share as we do scale, as the company continues to get larger, what are some of the things that you need to do to protect that culture? Yeah, that's a great question. So what makes the culture? I think it is people that don't take themselves super seriously. So I think there's a humility. I think that's an important part of the culture. I think we're doing great things. I think we are winning the market, but we don't feel like we need to boast about it as much as some people might. I think there's a desire to win. I think there's a competitive streak that exists throughout the organization in a healthy way, but really win the right way. I know I've said that a couple of times. It's like you can go out and win at all costs. You can you can represent yourself and your software as something you don't do. I think we have the most probably high integrity sales team of any sales team I've ever seen. Credit to you for building that. And I think people generally like each other. I mean, it's odd in a company like this, and you can kind of see people come in, how they fit in. In the situations where we, we have people that have left and haven't fit in, they kind of self-select out because they're not really, not that they're not fun and they don't like fun, but they're not competitive. They're not as excited about the build as, as you and I are. And I think that really defines the culture. And it's, I mean, the other thing a couple of people have said, it's nobody's mailing it in. Everyone's willing to take a phone call. Another thing I heard last night is everybody's just available to help and super warm and welcoming for people. And I felt like everyone was the same way when I joined. And I think that's something that's persisted. How do you maintain that? I think that's a really good question. I think you hire great people. I think you hire great people in leadership positions that value that because, you know, I knew everybody when I was 25, 30 people. Now I don't know everybody at the company. I haven't met everybody at the company personally. And so finding people that reflect those values in, in the leadership team, executive team, all the way down, like that's really critical. And you find people that not only value that through the hiring process, which I think is critical, but hard, you continuously probe and evaluate and test that through conversations you have with people. And it's not like the skip, skip level one-on-ones that you have, but it's like when you grab somebody to happy hour and you're like, hey, how's it going? You having a good time? Like same question I maybe asked you about having fun. And you can sense in those conversations the people who are really bought into what we're doing, really enjoy being here and are just real kind of like our people in that way. Yeah. You mentioned people being available and willing to help. Nobody hides. Like when things hit the fan, if you will, which bound to happen occasionally, Everyone is front and center. They're all willing to take the calls and jump in and have the conversations and meet with the appropriate customers. Five o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock at night. I mean, how many Teams chats have we been on at 1030 and there's 15 people on there all trying to solve a problem? I just, you know, nobody disappears. And I think that's a real strong self-fulfilling culture that nobody wants to let each other down in a way that creates a sense of accountability because people, they want to be there. They respect the people they work with. They're excited about the bill, but they don't want to disappear because disappearing feels uncomfortable. And like, that's the sign of a good culture. When you think about kind of your progression from 2015, 2016 to now as a CEO, what was something that you think you just did really well at the initial part of you acquiring Planet DDS that allowed for the foundation to be laid to grow to where we are today? And what's different about what you have to be great at today in order to continue to guide this company? 
I think we did hire great people. You were obviously first hire we did after level and obviously one of our best hires and super thrilled and appreciative to be working with you as a friend too. So I think that's the key thing for when we first joined, it was figuring out the areas of impact that you can make. So when you join a company as an outsider, right? When you buy a company, I use the analogy of you're a four organism in a host body and the host body is constantly trying to reject you. Size you up. This guy doesn't know what tech stack is. Like, you know, it's not real. So I, I think you have to build, you have to show the ability to make change quickly. And there are things that we all have different skills. My skill is not technology or dental, but there are things we could do. Clean up our ticketing system. We have a bunch of outstanding support tickets. So let's find the better application. Let's put processes in place to make the customer experience better. And if you do that quickly, then people are like, okay, maybe this guy, you know, can actually do something here. And so that was find the key wins early and build the credibility have a tremendous amount of humility, listen, understand that the people at, at the company have been working here know a ton more than you do. Respect that, listen to it, involve them in decision-making, like all that stuff is critical. And then the next phase is like building the right leadership team. That's where you came in and other people come in and that evolves over time. And like me as a CEO and all leaders have to evolve as the company evolves in order to be effective. But I think that was the second phase. It's like starting to really build the executive team in ways and, you know, some of those executive teams change. But I think that's the next phase that you do. Now, like we're starting to get to a point where a CEO's job becomes more around strategy, comes more around communication, alignment. So it was where I, you know, this is an interesting thing for me to think about as I grow and where my strengths are. It's digging in, doing the analysis, like getting stuff done versus giving up some of the control, delegating to great people, letting them execute, trusting them, which I, I think in certain cases I've been great at. Other cases I probably need to be better at. That becomes more important the bigger the company becomes. Like you are the cultural flag bearer. You are the person who, but you're also the cheerleader. You're also the supporting person. You're the articulator of the vision. Like that's, that is a much different skill set as the company grows. And then you become like, you know, if you're a huge company, like then you become the person who's, you know, almost a personage in some ways. You're not, like nobody really knows you, but they know you by reputation. And that's a different even level of skill that I think is, as a CEO, you have to evolve to. But we're kind of in that phase now where that's something that I'm focused a lot. You have a degree in mechanical engineering, right? So I just had a podcast episode with one of our customers, the CEO of My Orthodontist, Demi Pegues, and he also has a degree in mechanical engineering. And then he went and he got his MBA. Did you always know that you wanted to go into business, but you just were interested in engineering when you like entered college or university? Or was there like a shift at some point where you recognized this is not the path that I want to take? So... I knew I went, so we come from a family of engineers and my dad's a nuclear engineer. And so he basically bribed all of his children to get an engineering degree with a car that none of us got. So we all kind of were not super creative and all got engine. And was it a specific type of car? No, I actually ended up getting like a $500 hand-me-down Toyota Tercel, which was like 20 years old for my sister. Which, so technically, I guess I did have a car. So she got the car and then the car just got handed down. The car got handed out. But the, the promise was a new car. But when I remember driving back from school a couple of times, like whatever the spark plug or whatever it is in there, the pit would actually shoot out and it would create like someone like a shotgun and come and the car was, was not a safe vehicle. Thanks, Dad. I appreciate the. My dad was right. I mean, I think looking back, he knew that you get an education in the hearts of her and applied sciences like engineering. It teaches you not thermodynamics and fluid mechanics and chemistry and all that stuff, but it teaches you how to think. And it teaches you how to take a limited amount of information absorb it, analyze it, and draw a conclusion. That is a really interesting skill set and good, use, useful skill set that you can apply to anything. I never actually did it. After undergraduate, I was, went into construction. It's a man in project management, at which time I really enjoyed some of the business aspects of things. And I had some ownership of some projects that I really enjoyed. And it kind of gave, made me think I might want to go back to business school. My girlfriend at the time was in business school. I visited her. She was having a ton of fun. I was like, okay, let's go to business school. But I knew after some experiences post in my first and second job that I really enjoyed the ownership of entrepreneurship, of running something. And so it led me to look at opportunities to go to business school. In Planet DDS, there's a pretty broad demographic of employees. And I think it's part of what makes it such a great place to work. You have multiple generations. You have people from all different types of backgrounds. When you're managing or like Eric as a manager, do you think about treating or approaching different generations in a different way? Or do you feel like you are the same across the board in your approach? I mean, we talked about leading for results and that we've gone through that where you have to flex your style based on the, the motivation and ability 
of the person you're trying to lead or manage. I think they're definitely from a generational perspective, there's a difference. I think we've all probably seen it. They've worked with Gen X, Gen Z, whatever. There's definitely a, a need for more feedback, a need for more interaction, a need for them in that generation to feel like they belong to something and they're connected in ways that the work doesn't always just provide in ways that I think the older generation, if we put ourselves in the older generation, now maybe me, maybe not you. I mean, I think the relationships that you build in those type of things, like we play hoops every Thursday with a lot of younger engineers here. I think that's fun. I enjoy it because it keeps me not in shape. You're on IR, aren't you? Didn't you get put on the injured report? Yeah, the ham is still... We might hoop today. We got a happy hour after this. We might get a little run in before the happy hour. But it is, I think they, they enjoy it. We have a cool office. We have a brewery downstairs. We have a coffee shop. There's a basketball court right on campus. So like those things are important, I think, to that generation because it's not just work. It's like work, particularly post-COVID, becomes a source of a lot of your social interaction. And I think that the younger generations really do value that. And you have to create a, to have them feel engaged and excited about being here, you have to provide, or at least, if not provide that, provide the environment to allow that to foster naturally. I mean, I think I'm just me, like probably I, I like some of the younger guys. It's fun to play basketball and talk smack, you know, and all those things. So I think that's why well, I'm just giving my personality, but I, I don't think you approach it. But I, I think the generations are very different in, in what motivates them. And I think you do have to be cognizant. Yeah. So you, you just spoke a little bit about how there's the need to feel like some attachment and be involved in something that is important and that there is that connection to community. But we have multiple offices and we have a hybrid work environment. Why is that important to you in today's day and age? There are still many companies out there that are fully distributed, and there's many that are also fully back in the office. What's your perspective on what is gained or lost as a result of those workplace changes? I think it's hard to go from where we were to completely back in the office. If you do, like, you will pay some a penalty around great people who are self-motivated and super accountable that just don't want to sit in traffic. And I don't think that the world is necessary. But I do feel like, and this is unfortunate because we've hired people all over the country during COVID, like everyone did, and they can't come in an office. I think they're missing the connectivity to the culture. They're, they're missing the event we did last night with the Connies. Like they're missing the basketball and the happy hour. There's an element, I think work has a couple of purposes, obviously monetary to be able to survive. You have the purpose in the work, but you have the connection to people that I think is what make cultures important and make people happy with work. And I think in, for those people that are fully or virtual, even people that I talked to last night who I don't get to see that often, they're missing that. One person as an accepted speech, I can't remember who it was, thanked all the animals in his yard that visit him during the day. If he could come in the office a couple of days a week, there's no doubt in my mind he would. And I think that connectivity is important. It's not just the water cooler talk. It's not the osmosis of information, which I think people talk about. It's like feeling part of something. To feel part of something, there's a need for human interaction that isn't solved by teams, isn't solved by, you know, other types of technology. You have to spend time with people, I think. Yeah, I've been thinking about it more too. You can't replace the number of spontaneous engagements that you get with somebody throughout the day with teams remotely. It's just impossible because teams remotely is scheduled. Everything is scheduled. And so it's not even necessarily water cooler talk. It's, oh, I had this idea. I wanted to go run this by Che. I think this is cool. I give up on that notion if Che's not two offices down. And then maybe a great idea never gets spawned because it's not worth scheduling the appointment, finding the time, looking at the calendars. And so I think that there's a huge element of that becomes really beneficial when you're in a workplace with your colleagues. And I think a lot of people are, are feeling that too. Maybe I'm just selling it to myself still. No, I, I think you're right. I think the most pushback you've seen from people is when there's a five-day return to work policy and some areas about that. Most people that have, I mean, we've gone kind of, obviously in the policy is with the union certain readers, you have to come in two days a week. I think there were some grumblings initially. There might still be some grumblings I just don't hear about from some people, but I think most people have appreciated. You can't force people to be on a schedule. Life's a change. You can't force people to sit in traffic for an hour, two hours a day, back and forth. Like we figure out a way to work. Uh, remotely, fully during a period of COVID, you can figure out a way to get some flexibility. So look, it's towards the end of 2024. Interest rates finally for the first time just got dropped, just were reduced a bit. Uh, here's the dental economist to me coming out with my questions for you. But when you're looking at just kind of a high level of the industry, the Planet DDS business, however you want to frame it, and you pull out your crystal ball and make a prognosis for what you think is going to be happening over the next 12 to 18 months, what people are going to be focusing on and how the industry is going to be evolving as a result. Like, what do you think are the things that are the, the levers that are going to be pulled here? I think interest rates will drop. I think acquisitions will resume. I think there are enough financial sponsors or private equity funds that are committed. Uh, and I think more and more are showing interest in committing that 
their platform approach is going to require them to grow. And in an industry where you have 150,000 dentists, you're not going to have suddenly have 180,000 dental offices because the population grows at a certain rate. The only way to kind of do that is fundamentally through either being more efficient and safe for growth, which we hear all the time right now, or it's acquire and grow platforms. And I think that will start to pick up again. I think we're starting to see a little bit more of a tipping point when it comes to acceleration to cloud. We, you and I mentioned this before we were talking. We we're having conversations where we were, it felt like people would come to us whenever they had done a lot of research and soul searching around, maybe I need to book to a cloud solution. Now it feels like there's a little bit more of an opportunity where people are willing to listen to us about the benefits of being in the cloud, which suggests to me like there's a little bit more of a timetable and need to get to I think enough people have lived in the situation where they have, oh, we're just going to do four or five PMS and uh, solutions. And then at the end, they realize how hard that is to grow and maintain. And trade centers, training, centralized, all the things we talk about. So once that, I think that's starting to flip a little bit more and people are starting to realize that being on one solution, although hard, and we're working very hard to make it less hard, is like a really good place to be from a growth operational and profitability standpoint. I think that's going to continue to accelerate. I think, you know, it's interesting. I think you're going to start to see more experimentation around different healthcare delivery models. Obviously, Pacific Dental Service is doing something very interesting. I think other large DSS will probably take a look at that and decide whether or not they want to move into other specialties outside of dental. I have Walmart, I think, is picking back up and trying that again, it sounds like. So I think we'll see some evolution in that as well. Hopefully, it'd be... I think AI is going to continue to be super interesting. Obviously, lots of people we know raised a ton of capital and are talking about some really interesting things. And us as the system of record or practice management software, I think can help deliver some of the results of that in ways that people will adopt more quickly. And so like, I think that'll be a trend you'll continue to see evolve and become more standardized as opposed to, hey, what is AI? Let me try it out. And this is cool. Like, and I think as more patients start to be used to AI, it's going to potentially over time be part of a traditional patient experience. Mm-hmm. In which case, AI might have to exist for objectivity to be perceived. And then it might be more of, hey, everyone's going to have AI. There's a lot of interesting things happening there. But I, I think it, we've seen there's not been, it's not a recession-proof industry. Definitely there's been some rationalization happening in the industry in the last two years, like people closing lighter performing offices, people not being as acquisitive because capital is not as cheap. But most of our customers seem to be doing fairly well and continuing to grow and continue to try to find ways to platform to grow. So I think there are bright days ahead for Dental. What do you think about, you said that you think M&A will pick up again. Do you think we'll see more of the larger groups or mid-size, mid-market groups, 20 to 50 to 100, acquiring another 20 to 50 to 100? Because it seems like a lot of the M&A that was taking place previously, there was a couple of those big transactions that happened when small brands acquired Midwest, when Sunrava, you know, with Western acquired Mid-Atlantic, like those were big organizations acquiring other large organizations. Prior to that, it felt that it was predominantly like, hey, we have a a group of five or 10 under LOI. Do you think you'll see like larger merging of bigger groups or do you think it will continue to be kind of add-on roll-up style over time? I think you'll see distressed purchases of large groups. It's harder with larger groups, I think, when interest rates are high, because you have to, I mean, most of the smaller groups, you're benefiting from multiple expansion where you're buying at a certain multiple and your platform is traded at a certain multiple. So it's hard. So as long as money is reasonably priced, you can do that and stack. When you start buying the larger platforms, you're having to pay a premium for them. And so I don't know if that's really going to happen until interest rates really drop a lot again. And there's a real desire to want to grow in that way. I don't know, but I do think the people that I talk to our customers who are large are always talking about bringing larger platforms on because I think that's an exciting way to grow. It's fun. Like you can, you know, suddenly become a thousand location DSO through a couple of strokes of a bet. But we haven't seen that happen as much as I thought, particularly even when interest rates were low. I think as interest rate drops again, you'll start to see more of that. There's a lot of capital right now in the market. There's a ton of private equity funds who have a desire to grow. They tell us this all the time. I just think cost of capital makes the hurdle that much higher. And probably the big DSOs who are well run and super profitable and growing, they're probably going to wait until, you know, valuations change or improve again before thinking of combining with a large block. But that would be my guess. It's always to our benefit when M&A is taking place because we have so many customers that are the acquirers. But I think one of the side benefits that we're going to end up receiving from the higher interest rate environment is the recognition that to add value to your group, you actually do need to standardize. And then the option to centralize requires standardization because there was that kind of big arbitrage play where it was just acquiring the solos or the independent practices at that discounted rate that you could almost immediately turn into a higher valuation of that EBITDA. And we're seeing definitely kind of the shift where people are recognizing to your point with the same store growth, 
And so I think that might be one of these tailwinds that is actually a, a result of a higher interest rate environment. I'd say just from our personal engagement level with larger DSOs, it's been really high in the last year, as you know. I think it's because a lot of people, you're right, like there's only so many strategic initiatives a company can have and it's be acquisitive, integrate, maybe do it on a onesie, or it's okay, we put this stuff together. Now let's, now that we're not being acquisitive, let's go find a standard platform that allows us to grow when interest rates drop. And I think there's been a lot more of that right now because you've got a lot of smart people who are trying to grow through acquisition as quickly. And so, I, I mean, I think we've seen a lot of engagement and benefited from that to some degree. And I mean, the interesting thing too about our industry, as well as, you know, Mike, it's like there is almost a compounding effect, right? There's dentistry, everyone says this, dentist, dentistry is large, but small. It really is small in the DSO space. And the more of a footprint we have, I think the more um, people trust our ability to have a solution, have, be a partner to allow them to grow. And I think every year we get a little bit bigger and we have more DSOs, like it almost invites more DSOs to be like, what's going on over there? And I've talked to a couple of people that, you know, seem to like Plan DS and Dodecon or Cloud9 after it's like work. So like, I think that piece has started to help accelerate us a little bit, at least our opportunities to have people look at the software. And I see that continuing as well. So one of the, the focuses that, that we've seen Planet DDS have over the past six months to a year is really kind of this open approach to partnership. There's a lot of talk about dental OS. When you're thinking about the next 12 months, specifically for Planet DDS, Denicon, the, the business in general, what are you focusing on? What's important? And what value do you think Planet DDS is going to be bringing to the industry that might be different from what it's done in the past? Aside from us, obviously, being world-class and implementation, because switching software is still really hard, and I don't think we really crack that nut in terms of making it easy for people to do. It's still perceived, and probably rightfully so, as a hard initiative. I think you nailed it. From a product perspective, there's a lot, just in the last probably 18 months, a lot of companies that are doing very cool things around RCM in particular, uh, standardization of data, things like that, that we don't want our customers not to be able to take advantage. So we're an operating system in OS, we're a platform, we're committed to it. The idea being is we want to expose as much information, work with as many people as we can, such that if they're solving these really innovative RCM problems, our users and customers can consume those, the output of those solutions and be able to make the actual operations of a dental office much more streamlined. So like that, I think we'll continue to see that. There's so many cool like companies that are doing really cool stuff, particularly on eligibility and back-end claim submission. And then it's just, it's really kind of, kind of exciting to do that. The only way that really works, I think, in a meaningful way is that people are able to take advantage of the solutions or problems that they're solving, but they do it in their everyday workflows. We've seen this again and again. If somebody has to leave Denicon to do something else, it makes it very hard for them to do that consistently. If the solution that they provide is actually displayed in a workflow within Denicon, we find that people will use it consistently. And so we want our partners to take advantage of that, we want the industry to take advantage of that. We want to be the platform that allows people to take advantage. So I know that you're always looking to continually learn and grow. You should tell me about all the books you read all the time. I'm like every week it's a new book recommendation. Now, one of the things I, I appreciated about you in kind of I, probably the first two years that I was working with you is we were, I had a one-on-one -on -one at some point and I was talking about, you know, I haven't done this before. I'm going to give this a shot. It sounds like a good idea. And you're like, listen, man, I Google too. It's okay. And I was like, you know what? I appreciate the recognition that you don't need to know everything at all times. And it's okay to go out and find the answers to problems that you haven't solved before and do something new and different. When you think about like your continued progression as a CEO, like where do you go to learn? Like how do you, you know, find out about new things and what's your approach there? Twitter. No, X, come on now. X, that's right. There, no, I think there's some people you follow on there, particularly some, some very thought leaders and luminaries. I and mean, we went to Saster recently where you can kind of see what other people are doing and how they're thinking about things from like a technology perspective. AI within our own product suite as terms of ways that we can serve our customers better, not just from a Denicon product perspective, but using our, some of our software applications, I think is really critical. Like how are people thinking about productizing AI in their products from a vertical software perspective is massively interesting. So I think it's mostly online, specific people that guide information to you in those ways. I think that's so, so right. And I was actually just thinking about this the other day. As there was something I didn't know either. I was having a conversation with somebody. Like it's, I think it's fun if you don't know the end. And it's over time, like if, if you figure it out consistently enough, if you build the confidence in your ability to figure it out. And that's the cool thing too. Go try it. If it fails, like, it's not the end of the world. Like, we'll go try something else. But don't be overly committed, dogmatic to your opinions and ideas. Let the data drive kind of what the solution is. But hell, just try anything. On the marketing side, and 
we've tried so much stuff in just in the last 18 months, some of which has been great, most of which is actually been great, some of which has been abject failure, which we won't do again. And, but that's the fun time to learn, right? That's what makes this exciting day in and day out, which never makes me wake up in the morning being like, crap, I got to go to work. Because every day there's a new, so there's a new problem and you can work with great people that want to solve it. But I think it's okay. Plus, I also think most people like, are pretty astute. And if you fake it and it's fake it to make it, aspect, people will figure it out. I agree. But I do think there's like a, I think that ties to the ego thing. If you're afraid because of your ego to admit that you don't know how to do something, then it just creates more problems for yourself over time. So you definitely have created uh, an environment where it's okay to be like, I just don't know. And I'll figure this out or I'll find somebody smarter than me to figure this out or help us end up doing it. Well, the things that we are doing in a software company are things that other people have done. So just go ask somebody, it's like, how do you solve this problem? You don't, your ego doesn't need to get in the way. Like we don't have to have all the answers. We can go find people who do and then try them out. The best part of this entire podcast recording is I can get off this once we wrap here in just a few minutes. And I can tell Mehmet that you were calling a lot of his efforts abject failures. Just a couple of, you know, it's what we're talking about too. Right there. <laughs> I mean, I say that with pride and I think he would too. It's we're not failing at some things. We're not pushing the envelope. We're not trying. Failure is not something to be ashamed of. Not failing and not doing enough is. It's boring. That's where competition, that's where you lose the innovation game. Like you're not trying to do cool stuff. Some of which will inevitably not work. Then you're not working. That's a great spot to end this. So I appreciate you coming on the Dental Economist show. I'm really grateful that you came up with the name of the show too. It's fantastic. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate your time. We'll have to uh, do this again in the future. This has been a ton of fun. And I think it's great. Like I've always said, like you're, I mean, this is an example of experimenting and trying something that I think is really taken off. Every time I see it on LinkedIn or I listen to one of these things, I just, it's really good. Proud to see kind of how it's flourished and you've given Joe Rogan a run for his money. Don't quit playing DDS and be a full-time podcaster because it's getting quite good. We've got a ways to go for that to occur. I don't know. The 18 to 25 male business focused demographic in Ireland, I think you're killing it. That's right. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for coming on and we'll do it again. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. The Dental Economist Show is brought to you by Planet DDS home of Dental OS. To find out more about how cloud-based dental software by Planet DDS helps unleash dentists and their staff to focus on patient care, visit www.planetdds.com. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes by following wherever you listen to podcasts. And thank you for listening.